Hi and welcome back to the channel. So lots of people have been talking about experts and how do you know if your expert is really telling you the truth or telling the court the truth rather or whether they are just singing to the tune of what the person paying them wants them to say. So in this video I thought I would talk again to our Dr. Shaham Das, consultant forensic psychiatrist to give us some real stories, real experience on what this might entail. So uh, welcome back, Dr. Das. I uh, hope you're doing well. Hello, Mr. Shen Smith. Always a pleasure to be on your channel. Thank you for having me on again. My pleasure. So you, you very kindly offered to give us a couple of stories about uh, experts on when you think they might be just saying what their instructing person wants to say as opposed to what the court really wants to say. Just as a very broad, very brief, but broad outline um, for our viewers, as an expert, um, I can say as the lawyer, any expert is expected to give a completely impartial, independent opinion, an expert opinion, if the, if you will, one of the one of the few and only opinions that really ever counts to the court in evidence. And as an as an opinion, it needs to be expert and qualified, and it's usually instructed by one party or another. Sometimes it's a joint expert, very often it's an independent expert for each party, and such as the case in that case that everyone's been talking about, um, they've been independent experts. So with that in mind, um, the first of your two examples. Sure, um, just, just to add to what you're saying, Daniel, so uh, obviously you'll understand this, but for your viewers, I think something that gets misunderstood or lost sometimes is that experts supposed, are supposed to be completely 100% neutral. So even if they're instructed and paid by the defence or if they're instructed and paid by the prosecution, their opinion should only be for the court. So I guess what, what we're talking about are cowboy experts. So they're experts, I wouldn't say they're very common, but I've certainly come across a handful of them uh, in my career. So they're experts who basically um, lean towards the side that's paying them and they twist the evidence around so it leans that way presumably so that they keep getting instructions and so that they can keep making a living from it. And they sometimes garner a bit of a reputation. So I'll tell you a story of, of, what, uh, of what I've seen this actually happen in real life. Yeah, and, and so just before you go into that story, let's just touch very briefly on, on that issue of payment because the issue of payment comes up a lot. In fact, even our barrister's gown in, in the back there has a pocket on the back, which is that's, it's where the, the the saying comes from, slipping money in your back pocket. That is the back pocket on the back of the barrister's gown because we weren't supposed to be originally paid for the services. So to avoid any inference drawn that we are siding with one side or another. Um, obviously, over time, we had to be paid for our services, as do experts, and experts are paid. So being paid as an expert, the, the general position, this might sound obvious to most people, and certainly it is to you, Dr. Das, but certainly um, should sound obvious to most people. Being paid for your services should never compromise your position, however much you're paid. I mean, the, there are limits on it. And um, of course, if someone were paid ex ex exorbitant amounts of money, it it might suggest that they've been swayed. So just your general view, first of all, on being paid for providing that opinion. Sure. So the vast majority of the work that I do as a psychiatric expert will be legally aided. So that means that the individual, the defendant, isn't paying it directly from their own pocket. It will come from a central pool. So the reason that's significant or relevant is because when I put a quote in, then the, the solicitor that I'm writing the report on behalf of will have to send that quote to the legal aid agency. And they say yes or no. And as we all know, money's become quite tight, especially uh, in the legal sphere. So they're very, um, they're very aware if people try and overcharge. So they find out what the total amount of work is, how many medical notes, how many criminal, how much criminal records, case papers need to be read. So the point I'm trying to make is that within the system, that there isn't really a way for, for experts to be overpaid because they have to quote the number of hours they're doing. However, if somebody's praying privately, which doesn't happen that often, probably about 10% of my cases, maybe less, uh, that's where the legal aid authority don't think that a report is necessary. It might be beneficial, but it's not necessary, so they're not willing to pay for it. So the, the person themselves actually pays privately, and I think that's even more of a murkier area because then you know the client themselves are literally coming from their own uh, pocket. But when I take on these kind of cases, I usually do it through a solicitor. So I'll never take an instruction directly from an individual. 
and I make it crystal clear right at the beginning. I have this like template email that I've got saved in a Word document I send, and I just want your client to know that even though they're instructing me privately, my opinion is going to be neutral. It's going to be the for the court, so they should be aware that they, there's no sort of room for trying to persuade me uh, in terms of my conclusions at a later time. Indeed, and, and, and as it should be. And, and just so finally, before you move on to your story, I mean, what would be your response? What would you do? How would you react if, if someone were to say, hey, I want to pay you for your opinion. Um, I'll give you, you know, five, ten thousand pounds, dollars or, or whatever. Um, not even not even necessarily saying what they want you to do but it's obvious in in what they're doing what they want you to do what what would you do and how would you react yeah so that has happened a couple of times in my career not not very often but probably once every couple of years i just disassociate myself uh, i put as much distance as i can between them so i usually reply because i don't want to be rude uh, but i'll just i'll sometimes i might like, tell a white lie i might just say that i've got so much work on that um, i can't i don't have the capacity to take on this case and what i really don't want to do is get into a, a spiraling argument about what i can and can't say i think that's enough for me to know that you know it's not something i want to be involved in it could be professionally embarrassing can get struck off could lose my career and to be honest i get enough legal aid work that i don't need to uh, to be taking dodgy under the table uh, payments indeed the reason i asked that question and forgive me for asking the question because i know i didn't ask you or i didn't tell you we we're going to talk about this oh, yes. beforehand um the reason i did that without asking you the question is so that i can say now that i didn't ask you that question beforehand because i wanted your your uh, unscripted response which we've got which is exactly as i expected and everybody can hear it directly from you knowing that you know you've got my assurance that i didn't ask you that beforehand that 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 is the general response from an expert an expert is not going to compromise their career just as a lawyer is not going to compromise their career on one case you could offer a lawyer 10 15000 20000 whatever lawyers not going to compromise their career any more than an expert would so uh apologies but thank you um and uh yeah you you said you have two very interesting stories to to talk to us yeah. about no need to apologize i like being kept on my toes it's all good um so a couple of times where i think i've seen a cowboy expert so these are probably not people who have directly made an agreement with the individual or with the lawyer that they're definitely going to say um uh, like like that their evidence is is a, a foregone conclusion i don't think that's what happens i think that they want more work so they they lean towards a certain finding so i'll be specific so once i had an assessment both cases are related to fraud actually and they're both committed by women which makes them quite unusual once i had an assessment of a woman who um, she had fraud related to, it was like some sort of insurance scam i can't remember the exact details but she basically lied um in relation to her one of her warehouses being damaged and she made up a she made up a um lots of untruths about the extent of the damage I think it was in a fire so that she could try and commit insurance fraud and she was found out quite quickly because they sent an investigator and during the trial she suddenly seemed to have these sort of psychiatric symptoms she claimed that she had depression claimed that she had anxiety to me it was a bit all a bit um, unfeasible because as we know usually people have a gradual development of mental illnesses but almost out of the blue she had these diagnoses of anxiety and depression she was seen by a psychologist who assessed her fitness to plead so just very briefly fitness to plead is your ability to actually go through the trial process so it's not necessarily related to whether you're criminally culpable that's a whole different issue but it's whether you're well enough to actually enter a plea you know guilty not guilty understand what that plea is be able to follow evidence understand the court process etc and so it's really the frame of mind of understanding the charges and the case against you and being able to answer it as opposed to um, or anything else so just just your pure mental ability your mental state to cope with understanding that and pleading appropriately yes absolutely yeah and if somebody's found unfit to plea then there's a number of options for the court. They could section that person to a psychiatric hospital instead of prison. They could try and improve their mental health in the community. Uh, they could even drop the charges or they could have like um, a sentence that has mental health condition treatment requirements. But anyway, in this particular case, uh, the I thought that the expert did a very poor assessment, mainly because they didn't even address the allegations at all, the offence. So the psychologist had asked the defendant about her background and um, you know the usual stuff family history relationship history 
did, seemed to set, take her face value or her symptomatology. So she said mm. she was low, mm. said she was anxious, didn't seem to really challenge any of those points. Almost like she listed, yeah. she, she asked, just asked her what symptoms do you have and then listed them all. Came up with what I thought was quite a spurious diagnosis. I think at a stretch, she probably could have said she had anxiety and depression, but um, the experts said she had moderate to severe anxiety and depression, which is, you know, it's quite a high threshold to have those diagnoses. Your average person with moderate to severe anxiety and depression has a very low level of functioning, so it's not able to work, um, can probably wouldn't have anything that assembles a social life, probably needs a high level of support, and the expert didn't ask any questions about her functioning. But crucially, she didn't ask her about the offence, didn't ask her what the allegations were, what her version of events were, what, how she would plead. So I, I think this expert basically didn't know how to do a basic fitness to plead assessment. Mm -hmm. And without, I would, wouldn't want to bore your viewers by going into the individual criteria, but you will know there's a set of criteria called the Pritchard criteria, which is like a list of abilities that everybody has to have for them to be found fit to plead. And she didn't even mention the Pritchard criteria. So when I did my assessment, I thought that the defendant actually was fit to plead. You know, at, at a stretch, she might have had some anxiety and depression, possibly on a very mild degree. And it's probably related to the fact that she was going mm. through this court case and, and facing a prison sentence. So it certainly wasn't pathological. It was just a, a normal reaction. Uh, and she was a little bit reluctant to discuss her offending. But when I really pushed, she was able to give me uh, an account. And interesting, her, interestingly, her account of what mm. she said and why she said it was different to what she told the police. So as you'll know, I can't call a defendant a liar in a court report, but I can certainly highlight that there's a difference in, in what she's been reporting. So anyway, so I submit my report. I did comment on the other experts' report, and I tried to um, pitch my tone so I didn't look too aggressive or insulting. But I, I sort of said, respectfully, it seems that this expert has seemed to admit the Pritchard criteria. And then we went to um, give evidence in court. I remember it was in, uh, in Guildford Crown Court. And... To my surprise, the other expert just went on a, on a massive diatribe, just tried to kind of professionally embarrass me, I think because she basically doubled down on the fact that her assessment was so poor. Right. So, for example, she used all these rating scales and I commented on how these rating scales are not diagnostic. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> she it went on a, she made massive assumptions about how because she's a psychologist and I'm a psychiatrist that I wouldn't have training on these rating scales and therefore I wasn't qualified. Um, so basically she was going out of her way to try and discredit my evidence. Mm. Um, and I was raging or seething, really wanting to get back on the witness stand so that I could kind of defend myself yeah. because some of the stuff she said was simply untrue. So I'll give you another quick example. She said, uh, so the defendant was Asian, I'm Asian obviously, come from completely different backgrounds, different mm. religions, different, different parts of Asia. And she, the expert, tried to suggest that because we're Asian, mm. the defendant felt more comfortable with me and was able to tell me the backgrounds of her offenses. But because the other expert was white, the defendant wasn't comfortable in doing that. And that's obviously right. just complete bullcrap. She, she forgot to ask her. Yeah. She didn't ask her about those questions. Yeah. Um, so I was just waiting to have my chance to defend myself. And then I never got called back onto the witness stand. So that mm. was it. That was the end of the case. Yeah, and the judge overthrew her evidence and took mine. Um, but it was very frustrating for me because I really wanted to, to have my say to kind of uh, you know, yeah. to balance the personal attacks. And that's a big thing. A lot of people want to have their say. And um, I mean, it's interesting that the, the attack on the credibility because we we obviously do we do training specialist training on uh, examining in chief and cross-examining experts and one of the golden rules is don't go after the credibility unless you're absolutely sure because if they're an expert they're likely to be the expert to what you know whatever level the expert might be that they're going to be an expert so undermining the credibility is normally the last resort normally when you've got nothing else um because you can you you can pick apart with in inconsistencies you can pick apart with an evidential basis that undermines what they've said uh, so many different things before you go after the credibility and say well aha you know you're you've only done this for so long you've only done this you've only done that and that's just it's a very weak way of, of attacking um and evidence overall so what i think actually happened was that this expert i think is probably quite inexperienced in giving medical legal evidence mm. probably was a fairly decent you know clinical psychologist wanted to find enough uh, a finding of unfitness to plead because that would help us the help solicitors the and the lawyers out yeah. didn't really know how to do the assessment just tried to blag it so i think she said because this person was so anxious 
that means they're unfit to plead without looking at any of the medical yeah. criteria. I called them up on it, and then, yeah, the judge the judge agreed with me. Although I do feel frustrated that the judge didn't take it any further. So I think there would have been yeah. some. It would have been quite reasonable to possibly refer her to the you know the British Psychological Association or yeah. at um, least at least escalate the seriousness. A lot of people feel that way, like that, that they feel that when when someone's lied in court, they should be pulled upon perjury and everything else. And and of course. Uh, in in any court case when when one person is found to be truthful and someone else has said the complete reverse by default they're not telling the truth if there's a finding of fact in reverse so of course if every single person to ever lose a court case were to be up on perjury charges that'd be a bit of a problem but um to to what extent do you think she was deliberately skewing her opinion or just naive and inexperienced um i mean it's really hard to say because she didn't actually do the assessment she was supposed to do so if she had asked those questions and got very different answers to me then i could quite confidently say that she's you know she's doing something that goes beyond incompetency incompetency mm. she's doing something that's actually you know um libelous or was, yeah, unethical, possibly yeah. perjury. Yeah. unethical yeah. yeah i think that it was i think that she didn't actually know what she was doing and wanted more business so i do think there was something yeah. a little bit murky and ethical uh, but i don't think she realized yeah yeah sometimes you've just got the other you just got that idea it's as i did a video earlier today um uh, actually i mentioned you in it um for no other reason that it, it came to mind because of what i was saying but um there's this sort of human lie detector element to it which is why i still firmly believe we have the jury because among the jury i trust they come to the decision that between them they've all exercised their human lie detector and come to a come to the right verdict and that's what i think so that's interesting you say that and um and, and the second example so the second story is very similar in its setup uh, but i think the expert witness was 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 conned rather than was doing it intentionally. So I actually talk about this this lady in my uh, book, Into Minds. So in the book I called her, I call her Darina, the defendant, that's not her real name. So she is a Ukrainian ex-model. Mm -hmm. She was also involved in fraud. So she missold carbon credits. Uh, actually it was her cousin and her ex-boss whom she had an affair with who carried out most of the fraudulent activity. And Darina just siphoned off the money and, and basically washed, laundered the money. Uh, on, on their behalf so they eventually got caught and all three of them were put on trial and then Darina had a son I believe he was three or four at the time who had a very rare form of leukemia so he became really ill was on the verge of death didn't actually die but but almost did and Darina understandably became really upset and um, she became really distressed and they stayed her trial so they continued with the other two co-defendants and they retried her next the following year which is when I first met her and on the, what was quite interesting is she just refused to engage in the court process at all. So she wouldn't take phone calls from a solicitor, she wouldn't open any letters. When a solicitor finally did speak to her, she would just burst into tears mm -hmm. and, and not be able to maintain a conversation. So she saw another forensic psychiatrist on behalf of the defense, who's actually quite a, I won't mention his name, he's quite renowned in my field. He's the, his name is on the, on the spine of all the textbooks that I, that I buy but haven't yet got around to reading um, and I think he got hoodwinked I think that she was a you know pretty quite vulnerable uh, well-to-do well-spoken woman in front of her who was just crying the entire time and talking about how upset she was about her son so her son I should say was in remission but there's always mm. a risk that he could relapse he could mm. basically you know become very ill or possibly die within the space of months it could just happen uh, spontaneously mm. so understandably she was upset but Crucially, I don't think that he really pushed her to try and, and do the Pritchard criteria. So mm. when he was asking for her version of events, she cried so much, he never really got any kind of narrative from her. So he yeah. just wrote that she's too upset, she's unfit to plead. So the Crown Prosecution Service got this report and I think they challenged it because they, they smelt a rat, which mm -hmm. is when they instructed me. So I met, I met Darina. Uh, and there was something off about her presentation right from the beginning. Mm. So she was quite passive aggressive. Um, she cried a lot, uh, as I was expecting. But I found that I, because I, I politely, you know, I wasn't rude, but I, you know, 
had a bit of empathy for her, let her cry, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't drop the topics of her offending. I mm. carried on kind of pushing, really trying to dig to get her narrative and her depiction of events. Yeah. And what I found interesting was that she was absolutely fine and able to, in, in relaying some aspects of her history, like her relationship history, her family history, childhood, etc., etc. But she claimed to have absolutely no memory whatsoever of the alleged offences. So she couldn't tell me anything. She couldn't even tell me what kind of, kind of offence she was charged with. She couldn't say wow. it was fraud. I asked her, I prompted her with some very specific questions. I asked her if any family members were involved. She said she couldn't remember, one being a cousin. And I asked her the name of the other co-defendant who, remember, she had an affair with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she said she couldn't remember his name. So I just, I wasn't buying it. You know, even if somebody's really upset, yeah. you'd, you'd be able to remember the very, very basics. Uh, so I, I thought she was, she was trying to pull the wool over everyone's eyes. So mm. I, I wrote that in my report. I was quite respectful of the other experts' report because I didn't want to you know, c- commit career suicide. He's a very yeah. renowned forensic psychiatrist. But at the same time, I said with respect, I, I'm not sure if he pushed enough or if he you know, continued to, to try and uh, elicit the information from her. So there I was. We both gave evidence in court. And uh, to my shock, the because I think my evidence was fairly strong, and especially mm. the fact that she was able to recall other aspects of her life, but nothing about the, the, but nothing uh, about the that, offense. Yeah. To my surprise, the judge overruled my evidence and went with the other expert and found her unfit to plead. So just for a bit of damage control, I should say that I wrote in my report that there mm. might be humanitarian reasons yeah. to uh, to drop the charges or to, to, to not try her. So mm-hmm. you know, if the judge felt that they already had the main two perpetrators behind bars and she's got this ill child and for those reasons they didn't want to try her i I had no problem with that the problem that i had was trying to use uh trying to use mental illness as a reason to find her on as a reason yeah and a lot of people have got a problem with that to be fair i mean a a lot of people think that uh, i mean i've i've seen it i was asked recently i didn't give any details because i don't think it's right but i was asked recently whether i've seen that happen and i said yes i've seen that happen i've seen mental illness used as let's put it bluntly as an excuse for behavior and almost what what i've observed is almost immediately when someone raises it it does raise the guard of a lot of people around them almost to the extent in my view my observation that it changes people's behavior toward them and they may not press and push as much as they would otherwise I'm pleased to say that my experience to date with judges is is not that it's um, quite the reverse. Even even when someone has been absolutely reduced to floods of tears, but ultimately wrong, the judge I've seen what one stark case that I can remember was just judge absolutely stone faced, which is. You know, it's it's it, you know it's it's not the best sort of human quality, but it's certainly a quality you want in a judge, isn't it? You want you want a judge to be absolutely, I I don't I don't care if you're upset by this. I want the truth, yeah. and I want to find the truth, and I've seen that firsthand. And even even as the barrister on the other side of this, knowing that I think I think that person was being dishonest and everything else, but still floods of tears in front of a judge. Even I was impressed at the judge. Just no, not buying it. So uh, that's uh, I, I think that's important because it's equally important that mental health is addressed and, and given the attention that it deserves. But he, uh, just just in so much as it's not used as an a, excuse, what would you say, um, probably in closing comments, to to anyone that that thinks that it's being used as an excuse and is trying to trying to decide for themselves because they are not you, they are not. They don't have your qualifications, and we'll talk about your website in a minute before we go. But um, or your YouTube channel, rather. Um, what would you say to someone that is trying to decide whether or not someone is using something as an excuse, or or it is real? Because this, I can only imagine, this is going to be more and more prevalent in society. What? H- how would the average person, with all respect to the average person viewing, how would the average person decide? Are you talking about somebody who is like a barrister or a solicitor on behalf of their defendant? Do you mean, or do you mean just generally? Speaking? I mean generally. Um, I mean, okay. I mean, we we as as barristers and, and lawyers, and even you, I might I might assume have difficulties sometimes. But 
generally and anyone in society any employer we've we've had em, uh, employers approach us with employees who've made complaints about you know the mental health conditions which are uh, as yet undiagnosed but making making complaints or even making accusations and uh, and they're, they're left to decide what yeah. what whether it's real or not how how would one i mean you can't definitively tell people how to decide but what any any golden tips how would someone decide what yeah. what, what do they hang their hat on sure okay so it is, it's, it's obviously a very difficult question because there's so many different factors and so many different scenarios one thing that i would say or one thing i'd, I'd recognize before i actually answer the question is that it's a fine line isn't it it's a balance because on the one hand you don't want to pressurize somebody that might have mental health issues you don't want to kind of stigmatize them or make them feel targeted but on the other hand i would argue that if there are people who exaggerate their mental health issues and there absolutely are you know i do a lot of civil court case work and i see uh, people who either exaggerate or fabricate symptoms to either be let off a, 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 some sort of crime or have an issue at work whether it's bullying arguments etc etc so i guess the point i'm trying to make is absolutely does happen and I think that actually adds to the stigma of mental illness because it's it's almost like people appropriating mental illness to try and get out of their own sticky situations. Absolutely. But to get to to answer your question, um, I I do think that you need a professional. I think you need a forensic psychiatrist or another type of psychiatrist to assess because, well, uh, you know, obviously I would say that because that's how I make my money. Mm. But um, the reason that I think that is necessary is because. The mental illness is so complicated. There's mm. so many different diagnoses, mm. so many different types of presentation, even within the same diagnosis. And crucially, even if even if somebody has a diagnosis, which in itself is quite complicated to ascertain, that doesn't necessarily mean that their behaviour is um, it can be excused or is explainable by that mental health diagnosis. So mm. another way to put that is, I see a lot of defendants who have schizophrenia and their solicitors uh, are asking me to mm. decide whether they're not guilty by reason of insanity. Mm -hmm. And there, are, I, in fact, I'd argue there's more people with schizophrenia who might even have symptoms who are still criminally responsible for what they do mm -hmm. than there are people who aren't. When I mm -hmm. say people who aren't, I'm talking about people who reach the threshold for not guilty by reason of insanity. Yeah. So you need somebody with the time and the expertise to literally sift through all of their medical notes. Yeah. You know, so when I do it, I look at all of the evidence available all of the medical records. If it's like a criminal case, I'll be looking at case papers, I'll be looking at witness statements, I'll be looking at police, uh, it, transcripts of police interviews. So you really need that kind of level of detail to know for definite whether somebody's got a mental illness, whether they were having symptoms at the time of the whatever the incident was, yeah. uh, and crucially whether that um, explains that or excuses their behavior. So I yeah. do think you need a professional, you know, I, it, it, having done medical legal work, it's taken me years to build up the skill set, even after qualifying as a psychiatrist, to do all of that. Um, and so I think it's almost impossible to, for somebody to do without that clinical experience. Yeah, don't DIY then, guys. I mean, we, we, we say the same as, <laughs> uh, as, as lawyers. And, and again, you know, um, I hear what you're saying about the fees and everything else. And I can speak for you as much as I can speak for myself. It's not about the fee. We we don't say go to a professional because professionals charge fees. It's because you really can't do it yourself. I've seen cases that could have been one that are abysmally lost on bad pleadings. And that's not justice, but that's that's the way it goes because you justice is a, is not just the law and what's right and wrong it's following the procedure and there's a procedure and there's a fair procedure and it's there's a lot of fairness that goes into it so go you know go for the professional is is the word um and i was going to say one uh, other thing as you were uh, talking there yeah i had um, one example um that came to mind as you were talking um just to just to illustrate the point um i was about 30 minutes into a conference with somebody where only by way of my questioning such as um taking medication what's the medication for where did you get it from who prescribed it how often do you take it what is it what's it for and very cagey in the responses but ultimately it turns out i i was having a conference with someone who was a you know was certified with schizophrenia and of course, as a direct access barrister, it's not a hard and fast rule that I absolutely cannot deal with them directly. 
but I probably shouldn't. There should probably be a solicitor involved uh, for many reasons. Usually they've got a big firm with lots more support than, than we do as barristers and chambers. But um, I was over 30 minutes into a conference before it you know, even occurred that, that there would be any issue there. And so, and then, you know, the next, you know, I didn't charge for the, the, the conference. Um, I did direct towards a solicitor, but for, you know, the remainder of the conference was questions directed at making sure that I was sure that this was, this was really, and didn't want to tell me that there was, a, you know, a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Eventually he did, but you would not know. And so, so I, what I think is interesting about that situation, that very specific situation, if you had somebody who's being cagey and not really admitting to mm. uh, any symptoms and doesn't really want to discuss their medications, mm. really reluctant, that could actually be one of two things. It could be, mm. as what happened in your case, it could be that they're you know a little bit embarrassed, maybe they lack insight, they they don't want to discuss schizophrenia, but yes. have it. Or it could be somebody that's kind of making it up, that's thinking on the spot. Well, maybe if I say that I've got this mental illness, then it might it might get some leniency, it might get some yeah, sympathy. potentially. So that's why you need an expert, right? Because yeah. you need somebody that knows exactly what schizophrenia is, what the common symptoms absolutely. are. Absolutely, seen hundreds of cases. So yeah, that's why you need expertise. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it may have been completely made up and wrong. I mean, but in you know, I I have to take things on on face value and what I'm told, and so I took it as well. If this is the case, I can't proceed, and that was that. So um, un unless there was evidence presented to me to the contrary, but even then he would have lied to me. So, uh, you know, it, it, it scuppers my involvement anyway. But that's just for, for anyone listening, that that is the, the, the dilemma that we face every day. Um, but I think those are fascinating stories. Um, and just before I let you go, I will plug your channel once again. Um, a Psych for Sore Minds, um, some fantastic videos on here. Uh, psychoanalysis in in respect of criminal cases and how the criminal mind works i found them fascinating as a lawyer i'm sure you'll find them fascinating the channel is linked in the description below um you are growing rapidly now it seems with over just broken through 25 let's get you to 30 uh, and beyond and so um dr das it's been a pleasure and uh, i hope you'll come again soon Thank you, my man. It's always a pleasure talking to you. You always ask uh, really good questions, always have these fascinating discussions. So yeah, let's do it again sometime. I hope to see some of your viewers on my channel. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Smash the like button, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.